good afternoon. In the last class, we were considering the scenario where in the early universe, there were neutrons and protons and the hot CMBR obviously and electrons to balance the electric charge of the protons and these were in thermal and chemical equilibrium and we calculated the, so these neutrons and protons could form complex nuclei and we calculated the abundance of any nuclear species and uh, we had worked out that <coughs> in chemical and thermal equilibrium, the abundance of any particular nuclear species I will be given by this formula. Now, <coughs> in this formula, G I is the number of spin states which this nucleus can have. X P is a nucleon fraction in protons, X N is a nucleon, is a neutron fraction, uh, nucleon fraction in neutrons, A I is the <coughs> mass, atomic mass number, the weight, atomic weight of the complex nuclei, Z I is the atomic number, epsilon is this factor over here and there is this factor e to the power b i by k t, where b i is the binding energy of the nucleon. I had also told you that this number epsilon is extremely small. So, you do not have any significant abundance of any nuclei when this factor, when the temperature is much higher than the binding energy and the abundance develops a considerable abundance develops only when the temperature is lower than the binding energy. And I had given you the values of these binding energies. <coughs> uh, please note that the values I had given you were slightly incorrect in the ones I had given in the last class. So, these values are tabulated over here some of the relevant values. So, you can have deuterium which is one proton and one neutron combining and uh, <coughs> basically deuterium is one proton, one neutron. Then <coughs> you can have helium 3. So, the corresponding temperature is given over here for helium 3. <coughs> this is tritium hydrogen 3 and you have helium 4 and the higher <coughs> metals, the heavier metals, heavier elements have values of the binding energy per nucleon for heavier metals. This <coughs> Uh, this is the bind uh, is uh, comparable to that for helium, so it does not change. Okay. So, you get <coughs> significant abundances when the temperature, you will get significant abundance of helium 4 if the temperature falls below this value, you will get abundance of tritium of helium 3 and deuterium when the temperature falls below these values. So, if the neutron proton and uh, this whole thing is in chemical and thermal equilibrium. As the temp universe cools below 10 to the power 10 Kelvin and as it approaches 10 to the power 9 Kelvin and goes cooler than that, you would expect if everything were in thermal equilibrium, you would expect first the helium 4 and the heavier nuclei to form and then you would have <coughs> tritium H3 and helium 3 forming. H3 would rapidly decay to helium 3 and then finally, you would have deuterium forming when it falls below 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. This is provided all of these things are in thermal and chemical equilibrium, all the reactions are in equilibrium. Okay. But unfortunately, protons and neutrons were in thermal equilibrium, you would expect helium 4 to form first and then He 3, helium 3 and tritium would form. Tritium would rapidly decay to helium 3 and finally, when the universe had cooled below 10 to the 9 Kelvin, you would form deuterium. In reality, it does not work this way. And the reason why it does not work this way is that the <coughs> densities are 
are quite low. And as a consequence of the low density, only two body reactions are have significant rates compared to the expansion rate of the universe. All other reactions, the rates are too small to be comparable to the expansion rates of the universe and those reactions do not play any significant role. So, these <coughs> complex nuclei are built up by a sequence of processes. Let me write down this sequence. The first reaction in this sequence is a proton and a neutron. They combine to form the deuterium and a photon comes out. So, this is <coughs> the first step in the reaction. The second step in this reaction is a deuterium and a deuterium they combine and <coughs> these give rise to H3 attritium plus a proton. So, this is the first stage this is once the deuterium is formed two deuterium they combine to give a tritium and a proton. You could also have two deuteron, de, deuteron <coughs> nuclei combining to give a helium 3 plus a neutron. <coughs> and the, the next stage in this thing, the third stage would be the deuteron a deuterium, deuteron plus tritium, they would give rise to He4 plus a neutron or you could have a deuteron plus He3. giving rise to H e helium 4 plus a neutron plus a proton sorry. Now, H e 4 is the is the title is the it has the highest binding energy per nucleon amongst all of these and uh, ok. So, the heavy nuclei here have to be formed by a sequence of these reactions. So, helium 4 for example, would have to be formed by a sequence of these three reactions. Okay. So, let us consider the first stage in this, in this whole process. So, the first stage is the formation of deuterium and uh, so we will need this. So, the lambda d, this is the rate of deuterium, this is the deuterium formation rate, deuteron, deuteron production rate per neutron. This is four point five five into ten to the power minus twenty centimeter cube per second into the number density of protons. <coughs> And uh, we can replace the number density of of uh, protons in terms of omega baryon and uh, write it as two point five two into ten to the power four T 
by 10 to the power 10 Kelvin cube. This is a factor of A cube essentially into the, the proton h square and the quantity of importance is lambda this production rate into this into the time that elapses which is essentially lambda d by h this ratio and uh, this is equal to 4.5 into 10 to the power 4 So, we know this time that elapses at after positron electron annihilation, we have worked out the formula for the age of the universe, how the expansion of the universe. So, you can just substitute that and what you get is this into x proton omega baryon h square. Okay. So, this number is of the order unity and larger to well below 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. This number is of the order of unity to well below 10 to the power 9 Kelvin which is the which are the temperatures of our interest. So, the temperatures of our interest are in this range right. So, this the first reaction over here the main point of this is that the first reaction over here is in thermal equilibrium well below <coughs> 10 to the power 9 Kelvin from we can see from this. So, this number is of the order unity well below 10 to the power 9 Kelvin okay. and uh, so this reaction is in equilibrium <coughs> the formation of deuterium is in equilibrium. So, we have the expression <coughs> for the deuterium abundance and what we have to do is you can plug in the numbers for deuterium for the deuteron nuclei. So, we know the it is in the triplet state atomic number is known all of these numbers are known. So, one has to just plug in these numbers and what you get is that the deuterium abundance x d is equal to 3 root 2 so this is the deuterium the nucleon fraction in deuterium and the temperature corresponding to the binding energy of the deuterium is T deuterium <coughs> so what we see is that the deuterium abundance this so the first reaction is in chemical re, is in chemical and thermal equilibrium so the deuterium abundance deuterium becomes abundant only when the temperature falls below this value that was what we had seen in the last lecture right so the deuterium becomes abundant only when the temperature falls below this value so it is only when the temperatures fall below this value now the so the deuterium becomes abundant you require helium to form helium 4 you require these reactions these reactions are possible only when deuterium is abundant not otherwise okay so deuterium is abundant is rare at temperatures when you would expect helium 4 
or higher to form or other heavy nuclei to be abundant. That is the basic thing, right? We expect <coughs> these. We expect helium three to be abundant at this temperatures below this. But the problem is that you don't have sufficient deuterium <coughs> to form that all the way till this. So as a consequence of this, what happens is that <coughs> the two deuterium processes they are blocked. <coughs> So, the two deuterium processes, the two deuterium processes are deuterium plus deuterium goes to He3 plus a neutron or deuterium plus deuterium go to H3 plus a proton. These two are blocked. So, these two are blocked and as these two are blocked you cannot form helium, you cannot form the higher things. Okay. Now, there are other reactions, these so there are other reactions. So, the, so the uh, reaction rate per deuterium is quite low for these, but there are other reactions for example, the reaction like proton plus deuterium goes to <coughs> He3 plus a photon or a neutron <coughs> plus a deuterium goes to H3 plus a photon. Now, per so we are looking at the reaction rate per deuterium, deuteron nuclei. Okay. So, the reaction rate per deuteron nuclei is not blocked for this because the number density of this is going to be, it is going to be divided by this. So, that will just depend on the proton and this will just depend on the neutron abundance, but these reactions have intrinsically very small scattering cross section. These have very small so although these reactions have to be included in any calculation, the uh, they do not they cannot really contribute very much towards the formation of these higher uh, elements. So these it has to rely on these two reactions and these two reactions the formation of helium 4, helium 3 and tritium everything depends on these and these remain blocked all the way <coughs> till around <coughs> they remain blocked all the way around till around 10 to the power <coughs> seven, uh, 0.7 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. Okay. Now, let me <coughs> So, now what happens is that the moment the temperature, when the temperature falls, when T falls below the deuterium temperature, <coughs> what happens is that the moment the temperature falls below the deuterium temperature, the deuterium abundance goes up, this reaction proceeds and uh, helium 3 is formed, tritium is formed and then this reaction also proceeds and uh, helium 4 is formed. Okay. So, what happens is that all the, all the neutrons that were there, all the neutrons that were present gets locked up into helium 4. This has the, this is the most stable of the light nuclei. Now, it does not proceed any further, nucleosynthesis does not proceed further. Why does it not proceed further? The reason 
why it does not proceed any further is because there is an absence of nuclei with atomic number 5 or 8. See 5 or 8 because helium could in uh, scatter with proton or neutron and form something of atomic weight 5 or 2 helium could combine to form something of 8. Okay. But there are no <coughs> stable nuclei in this range. Okay, there are no stable nuclei in this range. So, in the cosmological scenario, the whole thing stops over here. Okay, so, you only produce up to helium, the stable. Okay, so, most of it goes into helium 4. Now, let me just tell you as an aside in stars, what happens in stars is somewhat different. In stars, again, you have this thing, same thing. Okay, you have the same thing you form helium 4, but in stars what happens helium 4 plus helium 4 they give rise to beryllium 8 which is unstable, <coughs> okay, which is unstable. Now this unstable beryllium 8 captures another helium 4 so resonant, this is a resonant capture. Okay. So there is a resonant capture of he another helium four, and it forms carbon twelve. Okay. So this is what happens in stars, but the time scales are too short in this cosmological scenario. You don't have sufficient time for this process to occur. So, the whole reaction does not proceed any further. Inside stars, you can form carbon 12 and then it goes on again, okay, because all the elements that you see are basically formed in exactly by this fusion process. So, inside stars, you have this reaction, beryllium 8 is formed and then carbon 12, and this is an unstable carbon 12. There are other reactions that follow after this, okay, but these are not important in a cosmological scenario. So, in cosmology, essentially, what happens is as follows. Let me explain to you what happens. So, all the <coughs> neutrons, see the crucial thing over here is, is the neutron, right. And we have seen that <coughs> once the temperature falls below the neutron proton mass difference, the neutrons essentially decay to give protons, right. So, whatever neutrons that survive till the epoch when deuterium abundance. So, whatever neutrons survive till T d, till this temperature is reached. You see the, the deuterium abundance becomes significant for helium 4 to form only around this temperature. Okay. So, whatever neutrons that survive till here, they are all trapped, all get, get trapped into the most stable nuclei helium 4. So, the neutron, neutron abundance at T d all gets converted into helium 4. Okay, that is the essential, that is the crux of the whole thing. Okay, so, the neutron, abund neutron abundance at this temperature corresponding to the neutron binding energy, this all gets converted into helium 4. Now, <coughs> this y is the neutron abundance by weight. Okay. This is the neutron abundance, the helium 4 abundance by weight, it is denoted by y <coughs> by weight. Okay. So, it is the helium abundance by weight and this is, so the, the number density of helium 4 
is n h e 4 then 4 times this divided by so finally you only have two things in abundance one is helium 4 another is the hydrogen the protons so some protons will find neutrons to form deuteron once this is this goes through then they will get to helium 4 some proton number is less than the, the neutron number is less than the proton number so there will be some protons left those will be the hydrogen okay so that is the only other abundant thing left so when you want to calculate the helium 4 abundance by weight this is the weight of helium 4 the total weight is the weight of helium 4 plus the proton or hydrogen whichever you wish okay nh if you wish to call it nh okay the number density of hydrogen okay so this is the helium abundance by weight and the proton abundance and proton so this should be hydrogen not proton three proton okay hydrogen the proton abundance each helium 4 has two protons and each hydrogen has one so it is given by this the neutron abundance the number density sorry the number density of neutrons this is number density of protons number density of neutrons is just two times so what we can do is we can substitute okay what we can do is we can use we have defined the neutron nucleon fraction to be the number density of neutron divided by number density of neutron plus number density of total nucleon this so we can express this in terms of the number density of helium 4 and hydrogen so in the numerator we have two number density of helium 4 in the denominator we have the sum of these two so we have four <coughs> number density of helium 4 plus so we have to add this and this in the denominator so we have four times this plus which you see is essentially half of the helium fraction abundance by weight right so this is half y or what we see is that the helium abundance by weight is essentially twice the fraction of the nucleons that are neutrons okay so the helium abundance by weight is essentially just twice the fraction of the nucleons that is in neutrons and we have calculated this already how xn behaves right this has been calculated and i showed you a table where the values were given as a function of temperature and time and as i have told you no so the neutron fraction the neutrons so this is essentially the neutron fraction at the epoch when all the neutrons get converted get trapped into helium nothing more than that okay and this is roughly the temperature corresponding to the deuteron binding energy now this is actually slightly higher than that it is not exactly that it is slightly slightly higher than that so <coughs> let me explain to you uh, why why it is slightly higher higher than that now these reactions deuterium plus deuterium going to these two reactions are exothermic reactions and in exothermic reactions scattering cross section 
is proportional to 1 by v in the limit where v goes to 0, very slow moving particles, the scattering cross section is 1 by v. Okay. So, the sigma deuteron plus deuteron goes to tritium plus a proton, this into the speed of the particle, this has a value 1.8 into 10 to the power minus 17 centimeter cube per second and deuteron plus deuteron goes to He3 plus a neutron into V. This has a value 1.7 into 10 to the power minus 17 centimeter cube per second. Okay. So, the total scattering rate, the reaction rate per deuteron, this is the reaction rate per deuteron, this has a value which is this thing, the sum of these two sigma plus sigma, sigma v plus sigma v, which I have written down here. So, each of these you have to add these two sigma v's and multiply it with the deuterium abundance into the number density of nucleons. Okay, this gives us the reaction rate per deuteron and this has a value which, which turns out the value of this turns out to be 1.9 into 10 to the power 7 T by 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, this whole cube omega baryon H square X D, the deuteron abundance uh, second inverse. Okay. So, this is the rate at which these reactions occur. Okay, so, the reactions which, so there are two steps, the first step is the formation of deuterium and I have told you that once the deuterium is formed, these reactions proceed. Now, <coughs> the second reaction has a rate given by this. Now, uh, we want to compare this to the Hubble parameter and this is 1 by 2 t and we have already calculated the expression for the time after positron electron annihilation. So, using that this has a value which is So, the Hubble parameter H is given by this and uh, what we see is that uh, at around 10 to the power uh, 9 Kelvin, which are the temperatures of our interest, lambda is equal to the Hubble parameter. So, this is lambda and this is the Hubble parameter. So, lambda is equal to the Hubble parameter for x the deuterium abundance so essentially we are comparing this with this and we are determining the value of this abundance where the two are comparable and for abundances larger than this, the reaction 
this reaction is in equilibrium and once this reaction is in equilibrium you start producing helium 4 okay so the bottom line of this is that this reaction becomes in equilibrium when the deuterium abundance has this value okay you don't need a very large abundance of deuterium for the reaction to proceed that's the basic thing and it so it starts so you, re, you at this value and this value is reached at temperatures which are larger than 10 to the power uh, so this value this abundance is reached at temperatures which are larger than the deuterium temperature so you start the the the, the you start these reactions you don't have to wait till 0 0.7 10 to the power 9 kelvin these reactions the deuterium abundance is sufficiently high at temperatures higher than that okay so at temperatures of around 10 to the power 9 okay so this xd has a value this the deuterium abundance the fraction has a value 0 0.6 into 10 to the power minus 5 for omega baryon h square is equal to 0 0.02 okay and this value is reached at 10 to the power 9 so somewhat before the deuterium temperature okay now the time that is required to reach 10 to the power 9 kelvin t is 168 seconds right after electron positron annihilation occurs we know that we have seen the expression for the time as a function of temperature and temperature as a function of time equivalent and we we can calculate that at it requires 1.168 seconds for the universe to cool to 10 to the power 9 kelvin okay and uh, so at this time we know that the proton the neutron abundance it decays with a time rate of 885 seconds i have told you this already so one can calculate the uh, the neutron uh, the neutron abundance and uh, the proton ab the helium the helium uh, primordial helium abundance is twice that so this is equal to 2 twice the factor of 2 comes in over here and then you have 0 0.1609 into exponential 168 by minus 168 by 885 right so this is the neutron fraction which we had already discussed and there is a factor of 2 which i have explained to you why so this gives us the helium abundance and this has a value 0 0.27 okay now this value is somewhat sensitive to omega baryon 8 square as you can see the sensi sensitivity to omega baryon 8 square is through this if you change omega baryon 8 square then the uh, required deuterium abundance changes and if the required deuterium abundance changes then uh, this value will change if I change this value this value will change and the temperature where this is achieved is also going to be different and uh, if the temperature where this is achieved is going to be different the time taken is also going to be different so the helium abundance is going to change okay so this whole thing is sensitive to omega baryon h square to some extent and uh, it is now common to use eta the nucleon to photon ratio or rather photon to nucleon ratio nucleon to photon ratio so 
So omega baryon h square can be written as 3.65 eta into 10 to the power 7. So this nucleon to photon ratio is a very small number. We have calculated this consider few few quite a few lectures ago. It turned out to be a very small number. This number is around 0 0.02. So from here you can see that eta is a very small number. You know the temperature of the photon background. So you can this is a very this is equivalent to omega baryon h square and uh, omega baryon h square zero to this corresponds to eta equal to three point five into ten to the power minus ten. It's a very small number. Okay. Now why the helium abundance changes it is zero point two three if you make eta equal to two into ten to the power minus ten. The bottom line of this whole thing is that if you increase omega baryon h square, if you increase this, then the value of the deuterium abundance that you require is smaller. A smaller value of deuterium abundance is achieved at a higher temperature. If you achieve a smaller, the say the required value of the deuterium abundance at a higher temperature, the time is smaller, so the neutron decay is smaller the neutron decay is smaller then the helium fraction helium abundance goes up. So if you increase omega baryon h square or if you increase eta the helium this is the primordial helium abundance the primordial he helium abundance increases which is what you see here if you increase eta the primordial helium abundance increases. Okay. Now this is an observationally determined quantity what people do is that they observe H2 ionized hydrogen regions H2 regions. Okay. Spectroscopic observations are carried out of H2 regions in compact blue galaxies. Okay. So spectroscopic in such compact blue galaxies people do spectroscopic observations of H2 by H2 what is meant is ionized hydrogen. Okay, so they observe regions in these galaxies where you have ionized hydrogen gas okay. and in from these observations people can determine the helium abundance. Okay, you can get the hydrogen and the helium abundance and you can get the, then the, helium, the, the number densities and from where you can work out the helium abundance. And in the 1990s there were observations which some observations indicated a group of observations indicated that <coughs> the helium abundance by weight had a value 0 0.243 plus minus 0.003. Okay. There were another group of these were the high abundance. Another group of set of observations indicated a value which was 0 0.234 plus minus 0 0.002 which were somewhat lower. And uh, <coughs> The uh, eta value, these observations though they were not mutually consistent, they were adequate to tell us that the universe had a hot past with eta in the range 10 to the power minus 10 to 10 to 5 into 10 to the power minus 10. 
okay, hot past why the nucleon per the nucleon per photon number had to be small. So, the photon the photons had to be large in number. Okay. So, the, these were the constraints at present these differences have been resolved better observations and better atomic data these differences have been resolved and at present observations indicate the helium fraction is 0 0.24 plus minus 0 0.0029 and uh, they require eta to be 5.813 plus minus uh, 1 1.81 1 into 10 to the power no this i should check this this please i have to check this number minus 10 the error bar seem to be a little too large okay but the bottom line of this whole okay so eta essentially reflects omega baryon h not square omega baryon h square okay so the helium abundance this is one of the things that the helium abundance depends on the helium abundance depends on the density parameter of the baryons into h square okay but it's a very weak dependence so the uncertainties in this eta are pretty large this number is a little too large i think i have made a mistake in uh, there will be some decimal places before this but the uncertainties are pretty large and uh, it's not very sensitive to omega baryon h square okay but it's a weak very weak dependence so they really don't put very severe constraints on this what what the helium abundance actually constraints let me tell you that the helium okay consider a cosmological scenario where you had flow four flavors of neutrinos instead of three okay let us just consider a cosmological scenario where you have four neutrino flavors and not three. What is the consequence of this? Let us see this. The main consequence of this after electron positron annihilation has taken place, if I had three neutrinos, let me first consider that. If I had three, so let me write down for three first. If I had three, then the density in relativistic particles, the density at that epoch would be let me write it as rho 3 this would be there are two photons a b the Boltzmann factor e to the power 4 and I have by 2 I have a factor of 2 due to the photons two polarizations now I have three neutrinos so that is six polarizations and they all each contribute 7 by 8 they are fermions factor of 7 by 8 lower and the temperature of the neutrinos is 4 by 11 to the power of one third smaller. So, this will be 4 by 11 to the power four third. So, this will be the density in this case if I had 4 neutrinos then the density would be again 2 photons plus here I would 8 I would have 8 7 by 8 4 by 11 to the power of 4 third Boltzmann factor e to the power 4 by 2. <coughs> right. So, the density would be higher if I had 4 neutrinos instead of 3 and you can precisely calculate how high it would be. Now, if you calculate the time, the age of the universe, this is proportional to 1 by the square root of the density. 
Okay, this is proportional to 1 by the square root of the density. This you can easily check. We can we have calculated it. So when you take the equation Einstein, the Friedman uh, the equation, the temperature, the time is related to the density as 1 by the square root of the density. So if I had, if I take the ratio of the time that I need to reach a certain temperature, if I take the ratio in this model and this model, the time would be shorter in a model with 4 neutrinos instead of 3. It would be shorter because the density is larger and it would be shorter by precisely the ratio of <coughs> these two numbers, the square root of that. Okay. So the time would get shortened by a factor if you calculate, it would be 333.3 or 336 by 381. This comes out to be 0 0.94. So, a sh so to reach the te same temperature, you would require a lesser time in a model with this as compared to this. Okay. If you had require a lesser time, the neutrons would decay less. If neutrons decay less, you have more neutrons, neutrons. So, if you have more neutrons, then you form more helium. So, the helium abundance will be higher. He4 or whether Yp is larger if 4 instead of 3 neutrinos flavors. Okay. And uh, Yp, precise calculations show that Yp increases by 0 0.01276. If I have 4 instead of 3 neutrinos, Yp, the helium abundance by weight, increases by this. If eta, if this depends on the value of eta, if eta is 10 to the power minus 10, and it increases by 0 0.01369 if eta is 5 into 10 to the power minus 10. Okay. So, uh, the helium abundance actually puts constraints on the expansion history of the universe, of the expansion history at the epoch when the nucleosynthesis took place. Okay. And uh, for quite some time, this was the best possible constraints that one had on neutrino flavors. So this puts a constraint that neutrinos with mass less than one of the order of one MeV or less, the number of flavors cannot be greater than four. Okay. But now, there are better constraints. So these constraints come from Z0, the decay width of the Z0 boson, okay, the Z0 decay width and what the constraints, what this gives is that for masses in the mass range Mz by 2, which is 45.6 GeV. So, if for neutrinos with masses less than this, the largest number of flavors, the maximum number of flavors is 3, cannot exceed 3. Okay. So, these are from, this is from particle physics experiments. So, the Z0 width of the decay, <coughs> observations of this or rather, okay. so from the Z0 width decay, people can put constraints that for neutrino masses, less than this, they can cannot, they can be at most three flavors. Okay. So, right now these, the helium abundance does not constrain the neutrino mass, but there are a host of other relativistic particles which could have been produced in the early universe. 
which many particle theory models predict, not neutrinos, some other kinds of particles. And uh, the helium abundance, observations of the helium abundance places useful constraints on the abundances of such particles. Okay. So, today I have explained to you the uh, helium abundance by weight, how it is calculated, how it is determined. The value is roughly around one fourth and more precise values are determined, uh, I mean are uh, so observationally determined values are much have achieved quite a great level of precision and these values put constraints on the expansion history at the epoch when nucleosynthesis occurred and it also is a test of this whole scenario of this hot big bang scenario. 